Well, okay. Well, good morning. Um, so good to see you guys and be with you guys again. I think the last time I was here, it was a few months ago or almost half a year. I don't even remember how long ago it was, but I'm always glad to be here. And thank you, Pastor Paul, for that introduction. I wasn't expecting that. Um, I just thought he expected to say young man. I wasn't expecting him to say handsome young man. Though you speak the truth. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, just kidding. Now you know how humble I am now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but no, I, it's great to be here again. Um, you know, first of all, thank you so much for all of your prayers um, that you actually have shown to our family when my wife's um, grandma passed away. Um, I, I really appreciate all of that. I mean, you guys were one of the few churches that actually sent us text messages and cards and flowers. And we were like, wow, like, and I only came here once, you know? So I was like, we were really moved. Our family was really, really thankful for your prayer. We knew that you guys were uh, praying for us. And, and through that, I can really see um, just your love for one another. And as you experience God's love, it really poured out from you to um, visitors like ourselves who came to your church only once, but I feel part of your family even through that. So really appreciate your prayers, really appreciate um, just all the love that you guys have shown our family through this time. Um, and, and we're very thankful because, yeah, th through the funeral and everything, we're able to share the gospel with my wife's family, um, even though the whole family were non-Christians. But um, only the Christians actually gave the eulogy, and so that's that. So we get to, sh <laughs> we, we get to share. Um, praise God. Uh, and so it is my privilege to share God's word with you again today. Today we're going to be talking about um, something that maybe you've heard before, but we're going to be talking a little bit about temptations this morning. Uh, whether you are trying to overcome an addiction, I don't know what it is, whether it's drinking or video games or whatever it is that's going on in your life, whether you're trying to follow Jesus, but you keep failing, like you keep feeling like, man, I keep going one step forward, but two steps back, or whether you know someone who's struggling in mental health or temptations and addictions. Oh, thank you. This one. All right, perfect. Um, yeah, whether you are going through experience or already know somebody, I believe that God does have something to say to each and every one of us this morning. And we're going to be looking at a text that we just read that if you've been coming to church for a very long time, you've probably had like a Bible study on it. You've probably had a sermon through this already, right? This, this text of Jesus being tempted in the desert, right? That gives probably have gone through probably messages and Bible studies through this already. But my prayer for you this morning is that God will build upon what he has already been teaching you through this text. And I pray that he will actually lead each and every one of us deeper to him this morning, to the gospel of this text here. And so we've already read the, the Bible. So let me just kind of pray for us and ask that the spirit will preach a far better sermon than whatever I can prepare for you this morning. So would you join me in prayer? Lord, as we come to you this morning, we're so thankful that we get to gather as your people to praise you, to worship you, to sit at your word, and to meditate upon it, Lord. God, I pray that as we gather here this morning, whatever worries and concerns, whatever things that are taking us away from you, God, God, help us to seek you first this morning, to allow your word to speak to us, God, and that our hearts would be open and ready to receive whatever it is that you want to say to us, God. We ask that your spirit will just illuminate the text for us this morning to help us see the gospel in a different light through this text and how much we are loved through your, the cross. God, we praise you and may you help us, Lord, this morning to hear and resonate with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here's the outline that we're going to look at this morning through this text here, and since we already read the text, we're going to look at three things through this text that's going to show you. In the Bible, you're going to see that through this text, one, you're going to be shown when you are actually the most weak and prone to temptations in your life. Second, we're going to see what is your motivation to overcome these temptations. And lastly, what is the means? How are you going to overcome the temptations in your life? Okay, so three parts. When you are most weak, how, what are your motivations to overcome it? And where does the power to overcome these temptations come from? So let's start with the first one, okay? When are you most weak to temptations? Now, one thing you need to know about temptations is that it's never just you 
and your temptations, right? There is always a third party involved, and that's Satan, and we see that in this text here. And Satan is really smart. He, he, knows when, he knows when you are the most weakest and when you're most prone to temptations, and he'll attack you during this time here. Because notice, notice as you read this text, Satan's timing. Look, look at when he actually shows up. I'm going to read it to you, Matthew 4, 1 to 3. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Right? Then, right, notice this starts with then. Then Jesus, this means something happened before Matthew chapter 4. If you read Matthew chapter 3, um, right before this, Jesus was baptized. And I see that you guys have a baptism thing coming, coming out, which is awesome. Right, but right before this, Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, and he's just about to begin his ministry. And now he's entered into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, and he's fasting, and we're told that he was hungry. And that's when Satan comes and tempts him the most, when his flesh desires it the most, when his body says, I want bun mi, or bread. That's Vietnamese bread, okay? For those, delicious stuff if you haven't tried it, okay? But because clearly Jesus is Vietnamese in my sermons. But he wants bun mi, okay? He was hungry. And, you know, my background is in counseling and psychology and before I actually entered the pastoral um, work. And in psychology and mental health, um, there is a model that they work with a lot of people going through temptations and addictions. And it's the model called HALT, okay? And it's used to help people who are addicted to things identify when they are the most vulnerable and weak to temptation, when they are most vulnerable to relapse in their life. And this is relevant for you and I uh, because I think we will all be prone to relapse of sins and to addictions and temptations in our life. And this model gives a pretty good guidance um, that has a lot of good biblical backing, as you will see. But anybody want to guess what HALT stands for? Like each of the letters stands for one condition that makes you vulnerable to temptations. H, what, is it? what do you think H is? You raise your hand? Yeah. Holy? Ah, close. It's a, it's a condition of yours that you're feeling. Okay, H. Hung, did somebody say hungry? Yes, hungry. When you're hungry, oh boy, are you weak to temptations. Okay, so hungry. What about for A? What do you think A would be? Any thoughts? Go ahead, just shout it out. No, no need to raise your hand. You're so polite. Huh? Angry, yes. So hungry, angry. What about the L? Lonely. And T? Ty, wow, you guys are good. Did you go through counseling too? Oh, good, good job. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. Exactly. You guys, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. You guys got all of them, right? And research has shown that if you have any one of these, you are much more prone to temptations in your life. And if two or more of this is in your life that are present, your ability to resist addiction and temptation, it just goes out the window. Like you, it's like KO. Like you don't even win if you have two of these conditions in your life. So notice what Satan is doing in this text. Right? He's really smart because he's coming to Jesus when he is the most vulnerable to temptations. Remember, he was hungry. Right? He was hungry in the desert. He's probably angry too. I don't know about you, but I get hangry. Like when I'm hungry, I also get angry. It just comes together. Like if I'm hungry, anger just, just comes along with it. And then he's by himself in the wilderness. So he's lonely. He's just totally out there by himself. And the fact that he's out in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, he's probably tired. All right? So notice when Satan comes to tempt Jesus. When he is basically almost all of these conditions, when he is the most weak, when he is the most vulnerable to temptations, Satan comes and he literally uh, tries to tempt him, right? Both literally and metaphorically. And, 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 and that's exactly what's happening here. But when that didn't work, when Satan comes, when he's most vulnerable, and when that didn't work, Satan actually ups the temptation. Do you see that text? He actually levels it up, right? Look at verse 5 through 6. He actually raises the temptation. He, he actually brings Jesus um, to the top of the holy city, as we read here, right? To the pinnacle of the temple, all the way to the top of the temple. And then he, and he tempts Jesus and he says, 
if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. So he literally levels up the temptation. He literally brings him to the desert, brings him up to the top of the temple and tells him to just jump down. And this is interesting because historically, you know, Jerusalem, the Holy Temple is where everybody gathers, right? That's where everybody is congregating here. And if you were to be climbing up the top of the mountain, like the temple, everyone is going to see you, right? And, and Satan is tempting Jesus with this. He's saying, hey, Jesus, don't you want more followers, right? Don't you want people to know you are the son of God? Don't you? That's what you came here for, right? So why don't you just stand on top of this temple where everybody sees you and just jump? If you jump, everyone's going to see you, right? God's going to save you, and you're going to get so much attention. You're going to get so many followers, right? Satan comes and levels up the addiction, the temptation, and when that didn't work, when that temptation failed, because Jesus rejected that, Satan levels up again. He takes it up another level, literally and physically, right? Where does, he do? Where does he take Jesus next after the temple? Do you remember the text? He takes him up to a very high mountain, right? Notice his, he's leveling up his temptation now. He's, now Satan is saying, Jesus, I'm going to take you up to the mountain and look at all the kingdoms of the world and all the glory. And he says, Jesus, I will give it to you. I'll give it to you. All you got to do is just bow down and you can have it. Like, didn't you come to save the world? Isn't that what you came for, Jesus? Right? Didn't, didn't you do that? So if you just bow down, I'll give it to you. Now think about how smart Satan is. This sounds really good, right? This is very tempting, right? This is temptation at the, like the highest level here, right? Because, it's, because what Satan is offering Jesus is no pain, all gain. No flogging, no crucifixion. You can have the world if you just bow down. Isn't that what you came for? It's yours, right? No need to go through all the people making fun of you. No need to go through all the stuff. It's just yours if you just simply bow down, right? That's very tempting, right? Do you see how smart Satan is? And so when Jesus was the most weak to temptations, right? Satan comes and he stacks one temptation, one temptation to another. And do you realize that Satan is using the exact same strategy for you and I today? Because it's so effective, because it's so good, right? When you are lonely, when you are hungry, when you are tired, when you are angry, those are the moments when you and I are the most weak and prone to temptations. Right? We are most vulnerable to the temptations of our flesh. Like we are most vulnerable to binge watch Netflix or watch stuff when we shouldn't watch late at night. Right? Lashing out at people closest to us when you are by yourself. Right? We are most vulnerable to the temptations to seek attention, right? to do crazy stuff on TikTok and IG, to gain more followers, to stay in a relationship, to talk with people who are full of red flags and are so toxic for you. But because you're so lonely, you're so vulnerable to that. Because you're so tired, you're so vulnerable to that. Right? We're so vulnerable to the temptations of power and wealth. Right? Think about Amazon and impulse buying things online, right? We buy expensive things online because we're just by ourselves at night or, or we're feeling angry, right? Or we feel so tempted to lie on our tax returns or turn against our own family members for a few extra dollars, right? Do you notice that those are all the time that we are most vulnerable and weak to temptations? Okay, confession. When I get really, really angry or emotional in some way, I have a habit of just like Amazon shopping. Like when I'm, I, I literally, like when I get angry or like I'm just like so emotional, that Amazon one click buy is like deadly for me. Like I just shop to make myself feel better. And I'm just vulnerable to that. And we're all vulnerable to some things, right? Um, especially for the men out there. When you are tired, when you are feeling emotionally down, late at night, in the middle of the night, in darkness, you know 
That is when you are most vulnerable to things on the internet. No matter how much you try to fight it, you have created the condition where it is impossible for you to win because you have literally invited multiple areas of weakness in your life all at the same time. And we're all prone to that vulnerability. And you realize that many of us, Satan doesn't even have to raise the bar. Like many of us fail at level one, right? Like at level one, like the temptations of the flesh, many of us are already like, okay, Satan, you win, right? Like it's interesting because the older you get, um, the temptations of the flesh becomes less weak. Like when you get older, especially for us who are older here, the physical temptations are not that strong. It's usually the more uh, spiritual temptation. It's the wealth condition. Like the level two and level threes, right? The desire to make a name for yourself, the desire to prove yourself, that became the much stronger temptations. Like many pastors, like level one temptations, we're like really good at saying, yeah, that's bad. We're going to stay away from that. But many of us fall to level two and level three temptation to make a name for ourselves, for people to follow us, for people to say, wow, you're so awesome, right? And, and do you realize that Matthew 4 is really comforting for me? It's very comforting. Because if Jesus is who he claims to be, that he really is God in the flesh, then that means what David just shared early in his prayer, that means he understands our struggles. Do you realize that? Right? That, that, that Jesus doesn't look down at you and your temptations and your struggle with temptation. He doesn't go, oh, you weaklings, you're so weak sauce. Like, how come you guys gave in to level one already? Because notice that he went through the most difficult temptations. So he understands how difficult it is. And the writers of Hebrew tells us this. At some point, it shall work. <laughs> Unless I don't have a slide for this. Oh, is it working? Okay, well, it's okay. Hebrews chapter 4, 15 reads, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. For one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet are without sin. And so even though Jesus faced the temptation at the highest point when he's most vulnerable in his life, he's overcome them. And through Jesus, do you realize that now he has provided you and I the motivation and the means to overcome these temptations, which is what we're going to look at in the bulk of the rest of our sermon here. But if you were to look at verse 4 with me, um, or if you have your Bible with you, Matthew 4, um, if you turn to Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, it reads, And this is our key verse this morning um, to really unlock the gospel in this text. It reads, but he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, one thing you need to know about the Bible, and whenever Jesus quotes something from the Bible, every single time he quotes something from the Bible, it's almost never, 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 never just about that one line, okay? Usually when Jesus quotes something from the Bible, it's, it's usually connected to a much larger thought. It's connected in a lot of ways. It's never just that one line that Jesus is trying to communicate. And so if you actually have your Bible with you um, or whatever device you have on your iPad or your iPhone, would you turn to me to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1 through 10? Oh, and it's back, so I can read it to you. Perfect. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1 through 10. And this passage takes place um, after God had rescued the Israelites from Egypt through Moses. You guys remember the whole Red, the, 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 Red, the crossing of the Red Sea story? So they've crossed the Red Sea. They're heading towards the promised land now. And they've been wandering in the desert, in the wilderness for some time. And as we read it, I would like you to read um, the highlighted verses out loud. So I'm going to read Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 10. Um, I would like you to read the yellow parts. Okay, can you see the yellow parts? Is it visible? Okay, so we're going to read it, okay? 1, 2, 3, I'm going to read it. The whole commandment that I command you today, that you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way 
that the Lord your God has led you these? That he might humble you, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and? And fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know. And here's the verse that we just all read. Here's the key verse in Matthew chapter 4 that Jesus quotes from. Yeah, so that's exactly where he's quoting from. And notice the similarity so far, right? Notice that they're in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights, there's 40 years. Notice that there is hunger involved in both of this. Notice that there is a test that God is saying, I'm going to test you whether you're going to trust God or not. Right? Church, this is not a coincidence, right? And here is the reason. Here's the reason why Jesus quotes this. Because so often when you hear the sermon, people focus on this and they say, memorize God's word, read God's word, just do more of God's word, which is true. But actually, it is so much deeper and so much more, okay? So you got to read the next part to understand why Jesus quotes this verse. And here's why he quoted the scripture here. And this is the reason and the motivation for us to overcome temptations here. He's, he continues, your clothing did not wear out on you and your foot did not swell these 40 years. Know then in your heart that So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking his ways and by fearing them. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks and water, of fountains and springs, flowing out in the valleys and hills. A land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which... A land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills you can dig copper. And you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Do you notice all the similarities? Do you notice about bread and being full and obedience and being tempted in the wilderness? When Jesus is quoting this, he's actually bringing you to Deuteronomy chapter 10 this entire time. And in other words, what we're being shown through this entire text is that this test is used to reveal what's in their hearts and to discipline the Israelites, right? That God is using this test in the wilderness, this temptation in the wilderness to help the Israelites see what is in their hearts and to discipline them for something better. For a land without scarcity where they will eat bread to the brim. Unlimited, all-you-can-eat, hometown buffet, but me. Those who know hometown buffet, that's a really old reference, okay? You guys don't even know this anymore. But that used to be the most glorious thing, okay? This was like buffet when it's at the highest peak. Now it's like McDonald's. <laughs> um, but in other words, what is happening is that Jesus is referencing this text for you to know that it's really meant to discipline them. And oftentimes, okay, if you're young, if you're the kid in here, you hear the word discipline, like y'all thinking like, dis like punishment. Like, I don't want to be disciplined. Like, oh, this sounds really bad here, okay? But actually, there's a difference, okay? Punishment is looking backwards to what you have done, and there's pain for that. Discipline is looking forward to something, and there is some pain along the way. There's a difference between discipline and punishment. Okay, so don't get the two confused. Punishment, yeah, you don't like it. That's icky. Discipline is actually good for you. You need some discipline in your life. It means to train. It means to look forward to something. It means to prepare you for something, and there's some pain along the way, but you're preparing yourself for something better, right? Discipline is what we all need in life. And I'm going to give you an example here that's relevant for all of you in this room here. Okay, so I, I have a four-year-old son. Okay, so I, when, when I had my son, um, I read a lot of parenting books. I, I, I'm an avid reader. And so I read everything I can on like how to raise my kids properly. What is the secret to raising a successful family? Okay, I did every kind of research. Like, like, like how do I know if my son is going to be successful when he gets older? 
right? So I did all of this thing, and there isn't really a clear answer in all the research, except, except one thing. One thing, every single book, every single research, every single psychologist who works with kid agrees that if your kid has this one attribute, it is proven that you can pretty much predict that they will be successful in life. One thing that if you have can indicate if you're going to be successful in life or not. And every research in psychology agrees on this only one thing. You know what it is? Yeah. I, I read it for you so you don't have to, okay? It's called, let me see if I have a text. Okay, discipline, sorry. It's called delayed in gratification. That is the number one strongest predictor if you will be successful in life or not, is your ability to have delayed gratification. And so they did this test here. Let me see if I actually have this. Okay, so there's a test, okay? And so Stanford does this. A lot of the people do this test here. Um, and what they would do is they would bring a bunch of kids, three-year-olds, four-year-olds. Well, who's the youngest in here? Who's the youngest in here? Who's young? Three, four-year-olds here? Any seven-year-olds, five-year-olds? Oh, there's a baby. Okay, babies don't count. <laughs> huh? Youngest in there? Like, okay, okay, over there, okay. So what they would do, okay, is they would actually bring these three-year-old kids into the, the lab. And, and, and what they would do is um, they, uh, they, would, uh, put the, they would bring the kid into a room exactly like this. They, they would put a marshmallow right in front of the three-year-old, a delicious marshmallow, okay? And then the researcher will say, okay, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to leave the room and um, basically don't eat the marshmallow, okay? When I come back, if you don't eat the marshmallow, I'm going to give you two marshmallows, okay? So that's the test. The research says, sit here, here's a marshmallow in front of you, I'm going to come back, if you don't eat it, I'll give you two marshmallows, okay? And this test is basically to see if the three-year-old um, will last without eating the marshmallow. It's really to test if they can delay their gratification, okay? Um, and so the longer that the kid can wait to not eat the marshmallow, the better predictor of an outcome for them in life. Okay, and I'll explain to you why later, right? Um, and so the longer they have, the higher chance they'll be successful in life. Um, in other words, the better the child is at saying no to immediate gratification, the temptation in front of them, right? To wait for something better, the more successful they will be. And now, there's some pain when you say no, of course, but it's good for you in the long run, right? And so what is happening is um, they, they do this marshmallow, and these kids, all these different kids from different ages would do all kinds of strategies. If you watch the video, it's really cute, right? Some kids, you, you'll see the kids be like, <laughs> some of them will be like, bonk, 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 bonk. Some of them will be like, no, 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 I don't see anything. They'll pretend they don't see anything. Some kids will be like, they'll look, they'll look, they'll be like, they'll lick, right? It's really funny if you watch these kids, right? They'll do all kinds of strategies. Some kids will pretend they don't see it. And other kids, as soon as the researcher walks out and the door closes, the kid goes, Tow. that's my son. <laughs> He's like, Tow. right? And, and so you see all kinds of kids, and they do this test for every single age. They do it for three-year-olds, they do it for four-year-olds, they do it for like five-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 15-year-olds, teenagers. And the point is, the older you are, there's a certain threshold that's considered like you have delayed gratification. So the older you are, your ability to resist temptation in front of you um, should have like a higher criteria, right? So there's kind of like they use all these numbers and all this math stuff that I don't like um, to help you determine your like level of gratification level, which will then predict how successful you'll be in life. And, and you notice this is why it's so important, right? Because um, the, the ability to say no to something in front of you, to wait for something better, is a life skill in order to be successful, right? And you have to make this decision every single day in your life. Do I play video games now, right? Or, and, and, and then, or do I wait to play video games after my homework? 
so that I can graduate, so that I can get a job, so that I can buy all the video games I want in the world. Just kidding, don't do that. But you know, that's the idea, right? Like do I, do, do, like, do I spend all my money, every single paycheck now to buy what I want? Or do I want to save some? Do I want to delay my gratification? Do I want to put it into a savings? Do I want to invest in it? for something later, right? Do you realize that the ability to delay your gratification plays out in all areas of your life, of life skills and how successful you can be? Can you say no to immediately right now and wait for some pain because you are looking for something better in the future? Most of life, if you want to be successful, requires you to have the ability to say no to immediate gratification for something better. Especially in addiction therapy, when you're addicted to something, when you're tempted to something, you can't just tell somebody to stop doing it. Like you can't just be like, stop being an alcoholic. Stop being a huge gambler. Like you can't just tell them to stop. Like stop watching Netflix every single night. Like you can't. Like you can't, right? You can't do that. Stop paying attention to that guy, right? Like you can't, you, no matter how much you try to. So the only way that you can help anybody with temptations and addictions is you actually um, have them, you actually have to replace it with something, right? Because people who are addicted to alcohol or drinking or binge watching or pornography or all these things, the reason why they are addicted to these things is because they're using it to cope with either internal or external life situations. So you can't just take away their coping mechanism from them. You can't just tell them to stop doing what they're doing because that's how they feel like they can survive life. So the only way they can help anybody going through temptations, you can help, the only way you can help anybody grow is if you replace it with something better, right? So the only way to help somebody experience um, freedom from uh, uh, like drinking to cope with depression is you have to actually replace drinking with something better than drinking. Right? You had to offer them something better that can actually cope with other life stuff. And that's the idea, that you have to replace it with something better. And some of you in this room, some of us right now, are probably in the wilderness right now. That some of us are being hit hard with one of these three most common temptations right now. Maybe all three of them you're experiencing right now. Right? Maybe some of you are being tempted to stay away from God and not trust Him because maybe your flesh, maybe it's a relationship that you're in with a non-Christian or with somebody who's clearly toxic is pulling you away from God. And you're tempted by that because you feel so lonely. Right? Maybe some of you are tempted to please the world around us because of your coworkers, because of your friend, because of your high school friend and your college friends, and you want to compromise your faith because you want the attention from those around you. Maybe some of you are tempted right now by wealth and power, right? That job that takes away all of your time where you don't have time to go to church, you don't have time to go to Bible study because that job is taking away from all that time. Maybe some of you are experiencing the wilderness and temptations right now in your life. And here's a framework that you can use to reevaluate your situation that you're in. Perhaps what you are going through is not you like, you know, sucking at living the Christian life. <laughs> Perhaps what you are going through is God is using this as a test to reveal what's in your heart and to discipline you for something better. That perhaps God is showing you something in your heart right now. And he's saying, hey, I want to show you what's in your heart and what you care about so that I can prepare you and discipline you for something better. God says, will you trust God and say no to your immediate gratification because God has promised you that he has something better from you, right? Will you say no to that because you know that God has something better from you? Like, oh, like that happy hour on Friday night or being at Bible study in this wholesome fellowship, being nourishing God's word, like which one is it, right? Oh, you know, like maybe like alone with the opposite gender in a private room or saving myself for the kind of enriching marriage that God has prepared me for, right? Maybe it's covering up whatever work uh, that you did, but covering up your, for yourself at work because you screwed up somehow because you're scared 
or admitting mistakes and telling the truth and be the kind of person and the character that God has called me to be. Whether it's holding back tithe or giving to God generously to trust that God will provide to be a mission-minded faith. These are all areas that we are so tempted to say, no, I want to withhold. I don't want to do this because we want to be immediately gratified. But God says, will you be able to trust me and say no to these things because I have something so much better for you? Will you say no to that relationship that's not helpful for you because I have prepared for you something better? Right? Will you say no to that temptation of being in the same room with an opposite gender by yourself? Or will you say no because God has prepared someone better for you in the future? And there's many, many, many more situations where God is revealing to us what's in our hearts so that we can exercise trust because God is preparing for us something better. And that should be our motivation, that there's something better for us. And now that's cool and all, okay? But how are we going to do that, right? What could possibly be better to motivate Jesus, though, right? For Jesus, he's already got everything, right? He's the son of God. Like, what could possibly be better for Jesus to be motivated to say no to all of these temptations, right? And then how are you and I supposed to have the exact same power to overcome these temptations? And here's the final part, which is here's the means to overcome temptation. And this is so important, I actually don't want you to miss this, okay? But this is probably, forget everything else, this is probably the most important part in the entire sermon. Because I told you earlier that the gospel is embedded in this passage. Think about this. Do you ever wonder, why did Jesus have to live for 33 years? I think, think about it, right? Like, it could have, everything he'd done could have taken three days, right? Jesus could have come down as an, a grown adult man. He could have died on the cross the next day, gets resurrected, right? He could have basically solved this in three days. Why did Jesus decide to walk the earth for 33 years and the first 30 years, almost as if nothing much has happened. Why would he do that? You ever think about that? Interestingly, in Matthew chapter 3, right before Matthew 4, right before Jesus enters into the wilderness, um, Jesus had a very interesting conversation with John the Baptist. Um, as John was baptizing Jesus in the Jordan River, um, and and, then, and then just as he was about to do that, right, Jesus came and says, okay, please baptize me, John. And John was like, no, 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 no. Like, you should be baptizing me. But, there, but Jesus responded with something very interesting, like very curious. That just seems kind of random. But he says this in Matthew chapter 3, verse 14. He says, and he answers John, let it be so now, in other words, baptize me, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Now, this is interesting. Right? He says that he needs to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness, and now he's entering to the desert to be tempted. Now, you've probably read this passage many times here, but if you were a Jewish audience, and you, you would know your Old Testament really, really well, okay? And if you were following Jesus' life up to Matthew chapter 4, you would immediately, as soon as you read this, and you read Matthew chapter 4, you would immediately go, oh, no way. This is not happening. No. Like, you would have been mind blown. And so many of us have probably read this text, probably missed this really important part here of the significance of Matthew chapter 4. And so let me, let me show you and let me walk you through Matthew 4 up to this point. In Matthew chapter 1, Jesus is born. And that's the Christmas story. You guys all know the Christmas story, right? Matthew is born. Uh, Jesus is born in Matthew chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 4, if you remember, in Matthew chapter 2 in the Christmas story, do you remember what happens? Uh, because of Herod the king being afraid of Jesus, um, his family, Joseph and Mary and Jesus, they actually had to flee to Egypt because Herod was going to kill all of the male children um, in his area here, right? And then, and then when Jesus grew up, um, he was led to the Jordan River, and in Matthew chapter 3, which I just shared with you, he gets baptized, and he crosses the Jordan River 
to begin his ministry. And now in Matthew chapter 4, he's in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, and he's being tempted by Satan whether or not he will obey God. Okay, Bible quiz. For those of you who know your Bible here, what Old Testament story does that sound like? Is it anything ringing a bell to you? Joshua, leading the river across the Jordan, yeah. Any, any other stories? Crossing the Red Sea, yeah. And I briefly mentioned it too, and that's right. Um, he's basically, it's a basically mentioning Israel's history. Let me read to you. So look, look at Exodus. So here's Matthew 1. I told you the, the, the genealogy, the, the sort of chronology. If you read the book of Exodus, look at the similarities. In Exodus 1 and 2, Moses was born, and Pharaoh kills all the firstborn male children. In Exodus 12, Moses led the Israelites to cross the Red Sea, and then once they enter into, once they cross into the wilderness in Deuteronomy, right, Israel is now wandering in the desert for 40 years because they fail to believe in God's promises and they keep disobeying God, right? Do you see what's happening here? this entire time when Jesus says, I have come to fulfill all righteousness, right? Jesus is actually recreating and reliving Israel's history this entire time. Why? Why was he doing that? Because his life was being prepared for something better than simply gratifying his temptations. And that something better was to fulfill all righteousness so that you and I can receive salvations. Right? Think about this. The Israelites were rescued by God out of slavery, but again and again and again. What was their main issues? What kept them wandering in the desert? Again and again and again is because God puts a test and they fail to trust God again and again and again. They keep failing to trust God, so they kept wandering in the desert again and again. That's why it took them 40 years to wander into the promised land, right? And what the Israelites fail to do, and generations and generations and generations fail to do, including you and I, we fail again and again and again in our temptation far too easily. Do you realize that Jesus has fulfilled do you see that? Do you realize that the test that the Israelites failed, the test that you and I failed, Jesus passed, right? That he fulfilled all the laws, all the covenants, all righteousness, so that when you put your faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross, we exchange our unrighteousness for his perfect righteousness, so that now you and I have the right to enter into the promised land. That it is no longer about my ability to overcome temptation, but because Jesus overcame temptation for me, even though I fail, even though I lose at level one again and again and again, I have the hope of the promised land now. Do you see the gospel here? That our salvation is not based on your ability to overcome temptation. And this is good news because if you are beating yourself up for giving into temptation again and again and again, if you've been beating yourself up and you're saying, man, I keep giving into this addiction, man, I keep falling into this again, then the good news is guess what? It's not based on your ability to overcome these temptations. You've been trying too hard to overcome it with your own power, and that's why you're failing. And for those of us who think we are so awesome that, oh, yeah, somehow I'm able to, um, uh, you know, like I can, I can, I, I don't give in to those kind of weaknesses. I'm not, I don't, I don't have that addiction. Well, guess what? It will humble you because you will realize that there's probably many areas that you did give in to and you don't puff yourself up because it's really based on Jesus' ability to overcome it for you that you have now the right and the privilege to enter into the promised land. Right? This is the gospel. Right? So many of us don't change and cannot overcome our temptation because we're so focused on what I must do. And you lose focus on the power that enables you to go into the promised land. It is not about you. And therefore, your guilt can be removed. But instead, I want to encourage you that even though we all fail to give into temptations, if you were to really tap into the gospel, it doesn't mean you are now powerless to temptations. Because Jesus overcame these temptations, you can now claim 
this victory as yours. In fact, C.S. Lewis now would argue for all the Christians, your problem, Christian's problem, is not that you have temptations or desires, but your desires are too weak for all the Christians. He writes this in The Weight of Glory, one of his book. He says this. He says, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what it is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. C.S. Lewis is saying that the reason why you and I give into the temptations in front of us, the binge watching, the pornography, the drinking, the uh, alcohol, the whatever stuff that you're giving into. The reason why you give into that is not because your desires are too weak. It's not because it's too strong. It's because you prefer something very weak, right? What he's trying to say is that you don't understand. Like, there is amazing, like, Wagyu steak beef offered to you, cooked like medium rare. And when you eat it, it's like, mmm. But so many of you prefer fully cooked hamburgers from McDonald's. And you think that's the best thing in the world. Right? That's what he's saying here. The problem is not that your temptations are strong, but you are too easily pleased and we don't know better. And we settle for mud pies, mud pies when the reality is God has prepared a banquet for you. That many of us are much more happy with mud pies than this amazing thing that God has prepared for you and your life if you were to simply able to say no to your immediate gratifications. So as you leave here today, I just have one thing I want to encourage you to pray for one another this week. Would you pray this for yourself and for your friends and for one another and for your church? Like, would you say, God, will you reveal to me all the mud pies in my life? Will you reveal to me what is going on in my heart? And will you help me to live for something better? Will you help me to live for something better and claim your victory in my life? And that's my prayer for you, that you will pray that for one another for God to show you the mud pies in your life and for you to desire to live for something better because God has prepared something much better for you than you can ever imagine. Infinite joy is waiting if you can say no to the immediate temptations in front of you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for just this morning that we get to gather to worship and praise you. God, we're so thankful that because you have what you have done on the cross, it is no longer based on our ability to resist temptations or to overcome it. But because you have overcome temptation, we now can tap into that power and claim your victory. God, I pray that your people will desire something more for their life, that they will desire to live for something better, that they will desire for um, the person that you decide to forge them to, Lord, to, to help them become the person that they can become a great blessing to, God. And there's so much, oh Lord, that you are preparing them for. God, help us today to see the mud pies in our life and not be so easily pleased, but help us to pursue you because you have already given everything for us. God, we thank you so much for your word and for the cross. And may, through your gospel, you will empower us, God, to overcome the temptations in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.